Welcome back, I'm Matt Chemist, and today we have four important papers in organic synthesis featuring some key CF3 chemistry. To provide a brief overview of what we're going to be covering today, we'll be discussing trifluoromethyl trimethyl silane, as well as the Tony reagents. We'll be discussing how various different trifluoromethyl ethers can be made, as well as how the synthesis of difluoromethyl ethers occurs, due to the importance of this one paper discussing the synthesis of difluoroethers. The first paper for today is a review summarizing a lot of the research that's been done with trifluoromethyl trimethyl silane. This is likely the most common CF3 reagent used in synthetic chemistry as it can be used for such a wide range of transformations. The way that this reagent is synthesized is fluoroform is treated with a base in the presence of trimethyl sal chloride. It's also possible to prepare analogs in case you wanted to do that for some reason. Occasionally you'll see the tris ethyl version used, but I'm not entirely sure why. Now once you have this reagent, in the presence of an activator such as fluoride, it's possible to release a CF3 anion. However, most of the time it's present in the pentavalent silicon anion form, but it is also possible to observe the CF3 anion under some conditions. Now once you have this activated species, it's possible for this to attack the carbon of a carbonyl, affording an alkoxide. This alkoxide, however, is a good activator, and this is able to react with trifluoromethyl trimethyl silane, affording the TMS ether product, as well as only requiring the fluoride as an initiator, since the alkoxide product eventually acts as an activator, driving this whole reaction forward. Usually this means that to deprotect these products, you're going to have to treat them with some sort of fluoride source, such as tetramethyl ammonium fluoride, which might be undesirable, but cesium fluoride and other alternatives can also be used. Now this one reaction showcases a few different things that you can do. Under milder conditions, it will tend to act as a CF3 nucleophile, adding at the ketone, but under harsher conditions, with sodium iodide as an activator, it's possible to generate a difluorocarbene, which can add into this alkyne, forming this gem difluorocyclopropene. When reacted with Weinreb amides, however, it's possible to prepare trifluoromethyl ketones. Another interesting example that was shown in this review was the addition of trifluoromethyl triethyl silane to benzoquinone, which afforded a wide range of phenols as well as this aniline. If we're looking at the formation of imines, it's also possible to add TMS-CF3 to those as well, affording trifluoromethyl amine type products. You might be familiar with efavirins, this is an anti-HIV medication, and this pharmaceutical has also been prepared using trifluoromethyl trimethyl silane, where it was added in an enantioselective fashion. The next paper for today is a review discussing the use of Tony reagents in organic synthesis. These are hypervalent iodine 3 reagents, which have a tendency to react as electrophilic CF3 sources. These can react with a wide range of different functional groups, affording products which have CF3s in various different contexts. There are other alternative reagents, however, such as the Umimoto type reagents, featuring a sulfur, selenium, tellurium, or even an oxygen. I want to stress here that there are a lot more CF3 reagents than the ones that I'm just discussing here, but these are some of the ones that are more commonly known. If you're curious about how Tony reagent is made, the alcohol-based reagent actually has an orgsin prep, where starting with 2-iodo-methyl benzoate, it's possible to prepare the alcohol using methyl magnesium iodide, followed by the synthesis of the hypervalent iodine chloride shown here, followed by the substitution with potassium acetate, and finally, TMS-CF3 affording Tony alcohol reagent 3. In the case of the acid reagent, it's even easier to prepare, but there are multiple different preps that you can follow. I've prepared a one-pot prep before that I think was from Orglet, and it was like the worst filtration of my life. So I would do a stepwise preparation if I were you. But you can see overall relatively easy to synthesize, and followed by substitution with TMS-CF3, we're afforded with the Tony acid reagent. Now, if you want to trifluoromethylate an alcohol, this only tends to work if Lewis acids such as zinc are used. Tony's group also prepared another hypervalent iodine reagent featuring a sulfoxamine, but this reagent isn't commercially available and it takes over six steps to prepare, so I've excluded this out of brevity. If you really want to make trifluoromethyl ethers, there are several different ways to do so, and in the third paper for today, we're going to be discussing that even more. The third paper for today discusses various ways to make trifluoromethyl ethers. One of the most interesting ways that I've come across is the use of trifluoromethyl silane along with select fluor and a silver catalyst. Not only do they use select fluor though, they also use NFSI. So there's a lot of fluorine chemistry going on in this reaction. The only ingredient that they have that doesn't have any fluorine is their starting material and the toluene solvent that they use. 
So this one might be good if you're just trying to make a little bit of a compound just to test its activity, but this wouldn't be one that would likely be used in any processes moving forward. So this is how the authors were able to make this compound, but I wonder if today's sponsor Reaxis has any alternative ideas about how we can synthesize this molecule. Today we'll be examining the retrosynthesis planning tool of Reaxis. First we're going to copy our structure from ChemDraw, which we can just copy as a smile string. Then we're going to paste it into the Reaxis retrosynthesis planning tool of Reaxis. We can remove any published routes, since we only care about the routes that Reaxis would propose could potentially work moving forward. The Reaxis retrosynthesis tool utilizes three neural networks trained on Reaxis data to generate synthesis plans. It breaks down product molecules into starting materials using extracted reaction rules, matching them against a library of building blocks. The algorithm iteratively resolves branches into available building blocks displaying predicted reaction steps along with literature examples based on similarity scores to estimate feasibility. You can change the result of a prediction by playing with the diversity and selected building block categories. In the first route, you can see that ethyl bromoacetate is used to accomplish a reformatsky reaction with our imine. This is just one possible way to synthesize a beta-lactam. However, in one of the alternative routes, the use of ketene is instead proposed. You might not want to work with ketene, and this other route even uses chloroacetyl chloride as a way to generate ketene in situ. In either case, the retrosynthesis planning tool from Reaxis is able to help you come up with new ideas for your research. If you're interested in finding out more, you can click the link in the video description. I'd like to thank Reaxis for their support of this channel. Another alternative is the use of trifluoromethoxide as a nucleophile. However, I will warn you, I did research with trifluoromethoxide, and it's one of the worst nucleophiles that exists. One of the more common ways to generate trifluoromethoxide is from trifluoromethyl triflate. Upon treatment with a fluoride source, this liberates a quaternary ammonium trifluoromethoxide, which can react with different electrophiles, although they tend to be very strong electrophiles in order for any reaction to occur. If you're looking to functionalize alpha diazoesters, it's possible to use silver catalysis with trifluoromethyl triflate or other alkoxide salts to install an alpha or even a gamma trifluoromethoxy group in the case of vinylagous diazo compounds such as 43. If you're looking to generate these types of reagents, but you don't want to make trifluoromethyl triflate, it's also possible to take benzene sulfonic acids, treat them with Tony reagent or Umamoto reagent, and then get a trifluoromethyl sulfonate, which can be used for subsequent chemistry. What sort of chemistry, you might ask? Well, perhaps the enantioselective ring opening of epoxides, for instance. This type of chemistry leverages Jacobson-type catalysts as a Lewis acid, which is able to coordinate to the epoxide and facilitate ring opening without also facilitating the decomposition of trifluoromethoxide, which is something that most Lewis acids have a tendency to do. This was some pretty key work in the field of trifluoromethoxide chemistry, as this is actually relatively useful. Additionally, it's possible to do metallophotoredox chemistry using rubipi and copper triflate, if you have some aryl diazonia to use. Another reagent that's worth mentioning is this pyridinium an oxide trifluoromethyl compound. This reagent is able to react under photochemical conditions as a radical OCF3 source. Sometimes you can get regioselective functionalization in the case of already heavily functionalized substrates, but as you can see in this case, we get a mixture of ortho, meta, and para when relatively unfunctionalized substrates are used. Overall, this is a creative way to install OCF3 groups directly without relying on any other inherent functionality initially. The last paper for today isn't a review, but it features the difluoromethylation of alcohols using bromodifluoromethyl trimethylsilane, which is a little bit like TMS-CF3, but instead of having a CF3, it just has a CF2Br. The nice thing about this reagent is it's actually possible to prepare it directly from TMS-CF3 using boron tribromide. However, if you've ever worked with boron tribromide, you'll know that it's utterly terrifying. So instead of doing that, you can also prepare TMS-CF2H using sodium borohydride, and subsequently brominate using NBS to afford the desired product. When this reagent is used, it ends up generating a difluorocarbene under very mild conditions. One possible mechanism is that the alcohol is first deprotonated to form an alkoxide. This alkoxide can attack the difluorocarbene, which can then form a carbanion, which upon subsequent protonation affords the desired product. An alternative mechanism occurs when the alcohol is still protonated and the carbene is able to react with the oxygen directly. Then, we'll have a shift of the proton onto the CF2, affording the desired product that way. The scope of this chemistry was quite wide, although in this paper they only show some examples. The main thing is that you have three different sets of conditions to screen for whatever alcohol you're trying to difluoromethylate. 
As a chemist who's worked on a lot of difluoromethylation strategies, this is my preferred way to do difluoromethylation because it works really well, and I've also tested it on novel substrates and it works. It's room temperature chemistry. If you can use potassium acetate in DCM water as your conditions to difluoromethylate something at room temp, that's incredible. Definitely go for this method if you're looking to try difluoromethylating one of your alcohols. Additionally, it's possible to get regioselective functionalization. In this case, they were able to selectively functionalize the aliphatic alcohol using KHF2. However, when they switched to KOH, they selectively functionalized the phenol. In this other case, the same thing occurred, but instead of functionalizing the phenol, they functionalized a thiol. Finally, in this case, when tetrabutylammonium bromide and toluene were used at 110 degrees Celsius, we instead get reactivity at this alkene, forming this gem difluorocyclopropane showing that regioselective functionalization can be easily achieved using this one reagent as long as you just know about what conditions to use. Finally, the authors examined a wide range of different alternatives to just showcase which reagents tended to have good reactivity and bad reactivity. There's a wide range of different difluorocarbene reagents that you can use, but among all of these, I have to say, for lab work on a bench scale, I would use TMS CF2BR just due to its convenience and commercial availability. I hope that this video has shown you some new fluorine chemistry that you weren't familiar with previously. Fluorine chemistry can seem like a really confusing, hard to navigate field, and that's just because there's a lot of really bad papers out there. The goal of this series is to help the really good papers elevate above the rest. And if you want to help that occur, make sure you share this with your friends and colleagues. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.